I just want to share a quote from Einstein where he failed to predict a future technology's viability. He says, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. So if Einstein failed at predicting a future technology's viability, what hopes should we have in what I've learned successfully doing so? Hey, what is going on guys? So we have a very special video today. We're going to be debunking what I've learned once again. If you haven't seen my other two 50 minute videos debunking his video titled vegan diets don't work, here's why. I strongly suggest you watch those after watching this one. It contains over 50 peer reviewed sources and really shows just how little what I've learned has learned. I'll have them linked below. Today, rather than discussing vegan diets, we're going to be debunking his video titled lab meat, the one trillion dollar ugly truth. This video aims to illustrate that cultured meat is a waste of time, not feasible, and built on falsehoods. Kind of like what I've learned's channel. I wanna say a couple things before diving into this video. In the coming years, it is clear that cultured meat is going to be a new topic heavily discussed by vegans, anti-vegans, and meat eaters in general. I think it is extremely important that vegans, and especially vegan activists, take the time to understand cultured meat, the arguments for it, against it, etc. It is clear that cultured meat being brought to scale is is the vegan movement's biggest chance at eliminating animal agriculture and making the whole concept of growing food off of and out of sentient beings entirely obsolete. Cultured meat becoming widely accessible could just be the end of animal agriculture as we know it. And with recent news like the USDA and FDA approving cultured meat to be sold to the public, it seems as though this feature may be coming sooner than we think. And progress to this feature will come with an opposition, which I think animal rights activists need to be prepared for. So please, if you find this video informative, please consider liking it, sharing it, rewatching it multiple times to get a better grasp of the topic at hand, and commenting. And secondly, this video, like many of my in-depth videos, took a lot of time to put together, and any support for this channel through Patreon is heavily appreciated. Every month, I become closer and closer to being financially able to work on my activism and YouTube channel full-time. So if you appreciate work like this and can support, please click the Patreon link in the pinned comment below. And lastly, I wanna give a big shout out to Beans for helping me research this video. He ended up doing a lot of the research for it, a link to his Twitter and new blog, where he debunks anti-vegan nonsense will be linked in the description. Now, let's get on with the video. Making chicken in there. A lab-grown chicken nugget. Chicken grown in a lab. Why are people making it? Climate change. Better for the environment. The environment. Lab meat is not going to save the planet or the animals. All right, well, any vegan or environmental activist who claims that lab-grown meat or cultured meat is going to save the planet is probably a little misguided. If anything, it will help the planet. And regarding the notion that it will save animals, I mean, yeah, if it's brought to scale, and you know prevents or replaces animal agriculture it will prevent billions of animals from being bred exploited commodified and murdered for food so then why has three billion dollars been invested into lab meat startups well to understand the full picture we'll first have to take a look at the science of why scaling lab meat is not practical at all second we'll look at why no one will be able to afford it third why it could be worse for the environment and finally whether the public and investors are being misled by unrealistically optimistic stories well let's see if what i've learned can successfully demonstrate this at first i was really optimistic about lab meat it made so much sense growing just a steak instead of a whole cow seemed to be way more efficient but then i started looking into it and it made less and less sense to take cells from a cow or chicken and grow them quickly, they need to be put in a very expensive custom-made bioreactor filled with a specially formulated liquid made with purified water, growth factors, purified amino acids, glucose, and salts. A cow just needs rainwater and grass. All right, so first of all, the number of specific needs something needs does not make that something necessarily more complicated or resource intensive than something else with less specific needs. For example, let's pretend product A needs 50 gallons of water, two acres of land, one specific kind of chemical, a shoe, and a banana. And product B just needs water and land, but a thousand gallons of water and 500 acres of land. It's pretty clear that although product A requires more specific kinds of resources, product B requires more resources overall. And a cow doesn't just need water and grass. A cow needs a massive amount of water and land. Beef requires 2,700 liters per kilogram to produce and 326 meters squared per kilogram to produce. And if you compare this to a published life cycle analysis of cultured meat from GFI or the Good Food Institute in Europe, you'll find that cultured meat uses less water, land, and emits 
less greenhouse gases than beef. And these emissions can be reduced in the future with more sustainable energy. Now notice I cited sources for my claims. Did what I've learned cite any sources while he put very professionally edited footage on the screen claiming that cultured meat requires a specially formulated liquid made of the purified water, growth factors, purified amino acids, glucose, and salts? No, he didn't. And he is almost certainly aware of this life cycle analysis because in his video, as you'll see as we continue to respond to it, he mentions the Good Food Institute multiple times, but for some reason could not cite it in his video. Now back to the claim that cows just need water and grass. Only 4% of the beef in the US is grass fed. And of that 4%, only 8% of it is grass finished. And if you don't know, grass finished is when the cow only consumes grass. So no, for the majority of cows, it is not just water and grass that we need like he seems to imagine. The facility and the bioreactor need to be totally sterile because a tiny amount of bacteria or virus could ruin the whole batch, wasting tons of money. A cow has an immune system, so it can just lay in the dirty grass outside. So first of all, he cited nothing for these claims. And second of all, I'm not sure why needing a sterile environment is an issue. We already established that cultured meat requires less resources than beef. Regardless, one can compare this need for a sterile environment to antibiotic use in animal agriculture, which uses 73% of antibiotics worldwide. A huge challenge to growing cells quickly inside of a bioreactor is developing ways to efficiently deliver oxygen and nutrients to each cell while removing waste products like ammonia, lactate, and CO2. A cow, on the other hand, handles all this really easily with lungs, blood vessels, and its liver. So this doesn't seem like a challenge or even remotely an issue considering it's been figured out. In a Singapore restaurant, there's a recent addition to the menu. This is chicken but not as we know it. The lab meat company Eat Just was actually selling lab-grown chicken nuggets straight to consumers in Singapore. But those cost upwards of $50 each to make. For that same price, about 1,500 nuggets could be made from conventional chicken meat. So, as with pretty much every emerging technology, they start out expensive and become cheaper over time. His own article even covered this when it discussed how the price went from $1,000 per chicken nugget to $50 per chicken nugget. Something not mentioned in the article he cited is that in 2013, a single patty cost 250,000 euros. The industry isn't showing any signs of price reductions slowing down. In this clip, what I've learned is acting like someone in the 90s saying that genome sequencing is used useless because it costs $300 million. Today it costs less than $1,000. This shows a clear lack of understanding on what I've learned's part when it comes to economies of scale. And here's something even more embarrassing and honestly just sketchy on what I've learned's part. What I've learned references a paper showing that cultured meat prices are dropping faster than genome sequencing. Of course, due to his usual cherry picking nature, he decided to cite the paper for a different reason. So just note that he is either aware of this or just hasn't fully read his reference. The reference also estimates that 75% of current costs can be eliminated by simply scaling up. The most common justification for lab meat is that we need it to prevent conventional meat from destroying the planet. And what is the problem that we try to solve by cultivated meat? So that we, we have a planet to inhabit. President Biden signed an executive order this year requiring federal agencies to support cultivating alternative food sources. Ezra Klein, founder of the hugely popular news media company Vox, wrote an article arguing that we need government funding into plant-based protein and lab meat to save the planet from climate change. And we need government support to get there. But you're getting all these people like pushing the government to fund this. Uh, it's, as soon as you show me it's better for the environment and there's like positive impacts, let's fund it. It's fine. But I do not see that. On the other hand, Dr. Derek Reisner points out in his PhD dissertation that despite all the hype and investment that has already been poured into lab meat, a detailed assessment of whether lab meat is actually better for the environment has not been properly done. So the dissertation that what I've learned cites here is 232 pages. It's clear he has not read it properly considering that he just said a detailed assessment of whether cultured meat is actually better for the environment has not been done. And the 232 page dissertation cites two detailed assessments on this. Let's be really clear about what just happened. In the section of the video where what I've learned cites a dissertation to support his claims, he also claims that a detailed assessment of cultured meat being better for the environment has not been done when the dissertation he cites actually cites two of them. Not to mention the third GFI analysis that Mosa Meats tweeted at him. We'll cover this later in the video. Now back to Risner's 232 page dissertation. The study makes bizarre assumptions not consistent with current, let alone future standard practices. Many of the mistakes were discussed in this letter to Risner from Elliot Schwartz. The mistakes include assuming that cultured meat producers will use pharmaceutical grade purification of each component of the medium individually. In reality, this isn't done and it wouldn't even be feasible. As Elliot Schwartz puts in his letter to Risner, quote, 
Previous techno-economic models, including your own, demonstrate that using pharmaceutical-grade media results in costs that are several orders of magnitude higher than conventional meat costs. It is simply not possible to bring cultivated meat to market using pharmaceutical-grade inputs. This is known by everyone in the industry, so attempting to portray this as a realistic scenario is neither accurate nor beneficial to the analysis. This mistake alone is responsible for basically the entire difference in the figure obtained in the study of cultured meat, emitting 4 to 25 times more carbon as beef. The letter to Risner also said, The UC Davis Cultivated Meat Consortium's External Advisory Board contains 10 individuals, including myself, and several cultivated meat startups and input suppliers that would have been happy to discuss this topic with you. It is unclear why you did not reach out to advisory board members to assess the current practices of the industry and to ensure the accuracy of your assumptions. As a result, you've come to a conclusion which is critical to the key findings that does not represent the most recent science. Moving on, when you factor in the errors made by Risner, you'll find that even if the world does not shift toward renewables, cultured meat is still less carbon intensive than beef in its best case ambitious scenarios. This is contrary to what Risner finds. And in the worst case scenario of cultured meat, where the world just continues with our current energy mix with no progress toward renewables and no further progress in cultured meat processes, cultured meat would emit 24.8 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of meat, while in the best case scenario for beef, beef would emit 35 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of meat. Keep in mind that it is very unlikely that these two scenarios would even co-occur. This is because we're talking about a world where all beef-related processes use purely renewable energy and cultivated meat is stuck with our current energy mix. Even then, beef emits 40% more CO2. We're gonna need all hands on deck to make these the global meat industry. One report commissioned by the Good Food Institute, GFI, a nonprofit which heavily promotes and supports the lab meat space, admitted that it would cost $450 million to make a facility producing a mere 22 million pounds of lab meat a year. That does sound like a lot, but if this steak represents the 100 billion pounds of normal meat that the US makes a year, this represents 22 million pounds, a mere 0.022% of US meat production. Alrighty guys, so what I've learned continues to fail to grasp that emerging technologies start expensive and then become cheaper with scale and innovation. He also cherry picked this $450 million estimate from their report and ignored the parts where they estimate price parity by 2030. It should also be mentioned that $450 million to make a facility that produces 22 million pounds of meat per year is not that bad. One cow has about 450 pounds of muscle meat, so that facility would be equivalent to the number of farms it takes to sell 50,000 cows for slaughter a year. And according to this article on how to start a cattle farm, it takes about $500,000 to start a new beef farm, and they predict you could sell two cows per week and scale up to five from there. So about 100 cows per year to begin with. So the equivalent amount of farms to this facility is about 500 farms for $500,000 each, or $250 million. Keep in mind the cost of slaughterhouses was not included in the $250 million needed for the farms. If they actually managed to produce the mere 22 million pounds that what I've learned is minimizing here for only $450 million, that would be great for a first operation of this size. And $450 million is the extra optimistic price tag. Another analysis put the cost of such a facility closer to $5 billion. What that would mean is that even if we assume that lab meat has zero emissions, if we wanted to reduce global emissions by 1 20th of 1%, we would first need to invest at least a trillion dollars just into the facilities for lab meat. All right, so first of all, it's not clear at all what makes the $450 million estimate optimistic or the other analysis he cited from David Humbird more credible. It's also not clear where he derived the $5 billion number from since he did not bother to be transparent about the steps. But let's do something for fun. Let's stick to what I've learned's calculations and assume that it will actually cost $5 billion for such a facility to exist and thus $1 trillion to replace meat consumption in the US. The US produces about 50 million tons of meat a year. If this transition to cultured meat occurred over 20 years, this would occur over a period of 1 billion tons of meat being produced, or 1 trillion kilograms of meat. This is because each year would come with 50 million tons of meat per year. So after 20 years, we'd be at 1 billion tons of meat. This means it would cost about $1 per kilogram of meat to make this transition. I also want you to keep in mind that the estimates of equipment costs in Humbert's analysis are the highest estimates of any analysis of this type and others, including Risner's analysis, which what I've learned repeatedly cites in this video, which is estimated to be about two thirds of the cost. It's also bizarre that what I've learned said at least $1 trillion would be the cost when he was using exaggerated estimates 
estimates to begin with. But in all honesty, it's understandable that what I've learned does not see how this transition could be made gradually given one of his main citations, the Humbert analysis, seems to suggest that cows grow in a slaughterhouse and was comparing the price of a slaughterhouse to a facility that is essentially the farm and the slaughterhouse. As it turns out, cows don't just grow in a slaughterhouse, they also grow on a farm. Crazy. This is Dr. Paul Wood, an ex-biopharma consultant and board member of Cellular Agriculture Australia. Uh, sustainability credentials will have to be earned. They can't just be assumed. I understand the, the energy intensity. I mean, you're running a whole lot of tanks at 37 degrees. They produce a lot of then radiant heat. So they actually have to air condition your rooms. If you're not using completely renewable energy, you won't be more sustainable. So just listing processes that will be required when running these tanks doesn't give us insight into the sustainability of the overall operation. If you want insight into the sustainability of cultured meat, just refer to earlier in this video where I cover it. It sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true. In 2021, Joe Fassler published a bombshell article in The Counter that laid out the specific technical details illustrating why lab meat is very likely a pipe dream. There are multiple breakthroughs that are needed, vast advances that would be worthy of Nobel Prizes, multiple Nobel Prizes. One of the many experts Fassler consulted with was David Humbert, a chemical engineer who wrote the most detailed analysis of scaling lab meat yet. Even in the most generous, best case, hypothetical scenario Humbert considered, where various economies of scale are included and all kinds of technological scientific breakthroughs are assumed to have happened. He projected that lab meat in the future would still be very, very unlikely to cost under $11 per pound to produce. With markup, that would easily be over $22 a pound at the supermarket. That's over four times the price of normal ground beef. Humbert honestly was being nice in his work. It's, I've, I've talked to Dave. I've talked to Dave Humbert. He was trying to make it work and he, he freaking couldn't. <laughs> like, he straight up, he's a, he's not going to do things that aren't factual. Yeah. So here, what I've learned just cites a 2021 opinion piece in a rapidly evolving field. I'm not sure we should be putting much stock in it. You also got to wonder if what I've learned considers this article from the same author, Joe Fassler, a bombshell article that literally attacks the meat industry. It goes over how adapting plant-rich diets could significantly reduce global warming. It covers the large land requirement of cattle, greenhouse gas emissions, and an exposing of a digital command center staffed 24 seven with the goal of demonstrating beef's very quote, positive sustainability for the environment. And the paper cited here contains several mistakes which were corrected in a document he is well aware of. We'll get to it later in the video because what I've learned is going to cite it again later on. And do you remember when what I've learned in the video said, cows only need water and grass? Well, this means he's referring to grass-fed and grass-finished beef. This costs around 11 to $15, not the $5 he's using here. He seems to fluidly shift between grass-fed, pasture-raised, organic, humane beef and conventional beef depending on what suits the context. Given what he said earlier about cows only needing grass and water, it's clear he is trying to speak about grass-finished beef. But when showing the prices here, he shows the price of conventional supermarket beef instead of the price of grass-finished beef. How not dishonest at all. And Fassler, the author of the 2021 opinion piece he cited earlier, consulted Alibaba vendors instead of the company's manufacturing cultured meat. In his article, it says, via a chat tool, I asked the Alibaba vendor if the product would be acceptable for use in pharmaceutical grade applications. Dear, she wrote back, it's organic fertilizer. And remember, we already covered earlier how cultured meat does not require pharmaceutical grade aminos. But hey, let's just ask Alibaba vendors about cultured meat as opposed to the companies actually developing cultured meat. What a beautiful opinion piece. Let's now go back to pricing. Ground beef is only this cheap artificially through government subsidies. In the US, $7.3 billion were spent on bailouts and subsidies from taxpayer money on beef in 2020. This is in addition to not having regulations that force farmers to internalize their externalities, leading us to figuratively and literally have to deal with their shit. In Vox's Netflix documentary, they said that Mosa Meat says it cut production costs to just $10 a burger. But I contacted that company and they said they didn't get down to $10 a burger. They said that $10 a burger was simply a target set in 2019. Yeah, so here's the part where the company tweeted at him a techno-economical analysis, which he proceeded to completely ignore for the rest of the video in favor of Risner's estimates based on pharmaceutical grade ingredients. Their techno-economic analysis says that with current best practices, the price is $150 per kilogram. So since the average burger is about four to six ounces, let's take five ounces. This is 140 grams for $21. So this isn't too far off on the logarithmic scale that emerging technologies tend to operate from. So so why is it so damn expensive? Again, the problem is not growing a bunch of lab meat. It's growing it for cheap so that people will actually buy it. It's not as simple as scaling up your equipment. It has to do with biological limits. 
For example, humans exist, but you can't have a 10 foot tall human. You can have a really big animal, but you can't have a really big animal with a really fast metabolic rate. You can grow cells outside of an animal in a large bioreactor, but you can't do it efficiently. So what I've learned has to explain what he means by efficiently here. Since he thinks that grass-fed cows are efficient, he must have a very creative definition of the word efficient. We'll talk more about what I've learned's use of the term efficiency in the next section. If you want to grow just the beef we eat cheaply and efficiently, you need the rest of that cow. All right. So the life cycle analysis cited earlier already demonstrates that with current methods and feasible improvements with scale, cultured meat is less resource intensive. So I'm not sure what he means by efficiently here. Also, the notion growing beef efficiently is a misnomer. There is no efficient way to grow the most inefficient form of protein possible. Beef uses 60% of agricultural land worldwide and supplies 2% of global calories. And it gets worse. Beef alone, while supplying 2% of global calories, is responsible for 40% of tropical deforestation, not to mention the opportunity cost of urban deforest land. And just another reminder that what I've learned starts his video by saying cows just need grass and water. So we shouldn't even be using stats for conventional beef. We should be using stats for grass finished beef so we can add 80% more land use requirements for his grass fed grass finished delusion. So in what I've learned's imaginary world where cows are efficient, they eat only grass and use 108% of current agricultural land to produce 2% of our calories. Amazing. Two huge problems limiting efficient cell growth in a bioreactor are getting enough oxygen and nutrients to the cells, and transporting CO2 and waste products away from the cells. First, mammals' complex vascular system is responsible for delivering oxygen and nutrients to all of their cells. It's arranged in an intricate fractal pattern such that all 100 trillion cells are within a mere 500 microns of a small capillary. With lab meat, the cells are just dumped in a liquid that has the nutrients they need, and the mixture is just stirred around to help expose all the cells to those nutrients. Oxygen is delivered to the cells by blowing bubbles into the tank. This nutrient liquid they use in bioreactors is only able to carry an amount of oxygen that is 45 times less than what real blood can carry. So this part is very interesting. The link he cited to support his claims here actually explain why the analysis from David Humebird the one he cited earlier, is riddled with errors. And in order to reach the 45 times less oxygen figure, he must have also read the parts correcting the errors in the citations his video is based on. Unless, of course, he has some novel reading technique. Let's now go over some of the errors in Hume Bird's analysis. So first off, it only considers soy as a source of amino acids, but companies use many others that require less processing like potato protein hydrosilate. It also assumes only farmer-grade glucose and amino acids will be used, but there is experimental evidence showing food-grade amino acids and glucose can be used and perform equally while being cheaper. And similarly, it assumes only pharmaceutical grade recombinant proteins will be used, but the industry is looking into and shifting towards recombinant production in plants, which could reduce costs by three orders of magnitude or a thousand times less. There are many other mistakes in the review pointed out in the article, but suffice to say that what I've learned is aware of this article correcting his earlier citation and shows to just cherry pick one figure that he liked about oxygen and blood. By the way, this nutrient liquid is currently so expensive and resource intensive that Dr. Derek Reisner's analysis suggests that lab meat may have a much higher environmental impact than normal meat. It's not good for the environment, which I don't think it is. It's not economically viable, which it, my own research is like, I don't know how you guys are going to make this economically viable. So it should be made clear that what I've learned is basically basing his entire video on two pieces of evidence riddled with mistakes. Rizzo's analysis constantly assumes that cultured meat will use pharmaceutical grade media, which as Elliot Swartz explained in his letter to Risner, is not based in reality. These materials are indeed resource expensive and thus pricey, but are not necessary or even viable as discussed earlier. Again, farmer grade ingredients are so prohibitively expensive, you cannot bring cultured meat to market using them. So commenting on the environmental impact of cultured meat produced with farmer grade ingredients is essentially a straw man. And Risner is aware of this, by the way, as his own analysis from 2020 shows. Reading Elliot Swartz's letter to Risner again, although the focus of the study is not on costs, cost and feasibility must also be considered when modeling different scenarios that are portrayed as being representative. Previous techno-economic models, including your own, demonstrate that using pharmaceutical grade media results in costs that are several orders of magnitude higher than conventional meat costs. It is simply not possible to bring cultivated meat to market using pharmaceutical grade 
rate of inputs. This is known by everyone in the industry. So attempting to portray this as a realistic scenario is neither accurate nor beneficial to the analysis. And here's an analysis of various scenarios of cultured meat production cited in Risner's paper, meaning he is aware of it. By Risner's calculations, it is not possible for cultivated meat to be economically viable without solving scenarios A to D. Scenario D or four is where they stopped using pharmaceutical grade growth factors and cultured meat production became economically viable. So it's just bizarre how Risner says, I don't know how you guys are gonna make it economically viable when he knows exactly how it can be, which is no longer using pharmaceutical grade growth factors. Also note that the assumptions made in the article titled lab grown meat could be 25 times worse for the climate than beef, which what I've learned had no problem showing in the video, would also mean the price of cultivated meat is about half a million dollars per kilogram. A price that would render its environmental impact irrelevant since you cannot mass sell any food that costs this much. You can see this in scenario one here based on Risner's paper. The pharmaceutical industry has been using tons and tons of bioreactors to make all sorts of products for decades now. Globally, about 23% of all drugs are made in bioreactors. If we're going to start using bioreactors for meat, we are going to need a ton of them. Pretend this represents the global meat demand. This is half of 1%. That is how much lab meat we would get if we had 11 to 22 times the entire pharmaceutical industry's current stainless steel bioreactor capacity just for growing lab meat. No citation was provided for any of this, so moving on. How many reactors you would need if you were to see a really significant replacement of, of current meat consumption? That's one hell of a lot of steel. Take the type of steel that you would need to make these tanks. You got to mine all that. You got to get it out of the ground. You have to process it. Where do these tanks come from? As part of normal cell metabolism, CO2 and waste products like ammonia and lactate are produced by the cells. It's almost like the cells are sitting in their own urine. When too much of these things build up in the tank, the cells don't do too well, and it reduces the rate that the cells grow. At some point, the cell growth will slow to a halt, and your cells will die from bathing in all that urine. So before that happens, you need to harvest your cells and start a new batch. David Humbert explains in his 2021 paper that biological limits like this are more often the issue than physical limits like tank size. Meaning you could have a 250,000 liter tank, but it would be completely worthless if your cells stopped growing at only 20,000 liters because of too much CO2 or ammonia building up. In the case of a cow, its bloodstream would simply transfer the CO2 away from the cells to the lungs to be breathed out, and ammonia and lactate would be transported to the liver to get rid of it. With bioreactors, there is a process called perfusion, which can clear out some of the CO2 and ammonia, which will improve the cell growth. But that equipment is way too expensive to use for making millions of pounds of lab meat. Humbert calculates that even though you are growing the cells more efficiently, it would cost even more driving up the cost of lab meat an extra $6 per pound. This is just one of the many problems that need to be solved to make lab meat cheap enough for the average person to buy. So this part is just really weird. What I've learned mentions this as a problem that needs to be solved to make cultured meat cheap, but all this shows on what I've learned's part is an immense lack of an idea of the cost breakdown of cultured meat. The majority of the cost of cultured meat is in the media used. The major cost saving potential of cultured meat thus lies in the media used, specifically albumin, transferrin, growth factors, recombinant proteins, etc. Not trying to make the cells not bathe than urine. This is from the techno-economic assessment that he was linked when he questioned most of meats. Here are the cost-saving opportunities explored in it. As you can see, the main concerns are with volume and the price of media and its components. But is lab meat even meat? It is 100% meat. Because it will taste like animal meat because that's exactly what it is. The result is actual animal flesh. First of all, what usually comes out of these bioreactors is called cell slurry. Slurry of cells, right? That's what's coming out of a bioreactor. It's, it's not the most appetizing uh, thing. I call our product Little Lisa's patented animal slurry. A spoonful of slurry will cure what ails ya. Most future lab meat products will be blended with other non-meat ingredients and formed into homogenized things like burger patties, nuggets, sausages, meatballs, and hot dogs. So keep in mind that his source does not say that most future lab meat will be blended with plant-based ingredients. They simply say that many manufacturers are trying that for now. So it's not clear why he said most when discussing this topic. Most future lab meat products will be blended with other non-meat ingredients. Most future lab meat products... We're not going to come out with a steak. We're going to come out with a hamburger. Mm -hmm. So it's a structured stuff. Real meat is composed of various types of cells. It has its familiar texture thanks to both muscle fibers and fat cells, as well as blood vessels, tendons, connective tissues, and so on. But bioreactors typically can only cultivate one type of cell at a time. 
meaning an entirely different process will be needed to assemble various cells and additives together into a texture that resembles something like a steak or pork chop. This isn't accurate. Upside Foods cultures fibroblasts as well, and you can see a chef demonstrating the result here. So here we have the upside cultivated chicken filet. It looks exactly like a normal piece of raw chicken. I can see the texture, it's shiny. I can't wait to see how it cooks. Ooh, it certainly sounds the same. It's gonna start shrinking like you would expect meat fibers to, so that contraction is really indicative of there being like animal protein in there. It's not something you necessarily get from plant-based. And as I push down here, you can see that resistance and that bounce yes. back of the muscle. And then when we flip it, you'll be able to see that Ooh, nice crust. It's like caramelization, it's browning. And all of that is coming from this Maillard reaction that's happening here, which is the browning of proteins. Mm -hmm. And that's what really gives you that meaty flavor, meaty aroma, meaty taste. And here you can see the CEO of Upside Foods saying that they do not just culture myocytes or muscle cells, but also fibroblasts and adipocytes. And they can alter the ratios of them to create different textures and flavors. And we have all kinds of cells. We have uh, what we call fibroblasts, we have uh, myoblasts, and you know, there's other cells that accumulate a lot of fat, um, and we're trying to play with the taste and the textures of each of those cells when you put it into a format of a meat. We're trying to build it from the most fundamental building blocks. So the price is even more important because while someone might pay top dollar for a T-bone steak, they're not going to pay $20 a pound for mashy ground beef. Several of the compounds that contribute to the flavor and nutritional profile of meat arrive there thanks to processes going on elsewhere in the animal's body. These things don't just appear in the cells. So to match real meat, various nutrients and compounds will need to be added one by one at some point in the process of making lab meat. All right, so here he did not give any example of a compound, so it's not clear what he is talking about, but there is no reason to think that we couldn't just add the compound. It's also important to note that he is so concerned over people not liking it because it has no shape or form, but the most common sold beef by far in the US is ground beef. The point is a lot of work will need to be done to get consumers to actually like it as much as real meat. The lab meat industry has a history of making promises they can't keep. In 2021, Mother Jones published an illustration of the many, many predictions made by research institutions and lab meat companies about when lab meat would be available. That ended up being wrong. So I'm not sure what he's talking about here. If you draw a line at 2023, when the first cultured meat was approved in the USA, many of the predictions are remarkably converging on 2023, when the first cultivated meat was approved for sale. As you're building a business, don't be naive about the power of storytelling. You need them to give you money when all you have is a PowerPoint deck. This is Josh Hoffman. He was the CEO of the synthetic biology company Zymergen. His skill of painting a vision for the future earned Zymergen $1 billion of venture capital. Zymergen is rewriting the potential of biology. Our work has the potential to revolutionize chemicals and materials, agriculture, human health. So we really think this has the potential to change the entire economy. He had an optimistic vision of reducing our reliance on petrochemicals by producing everyday products like anything from optic film to mosquito repellent in bioreactors. These bioreactors would be filled with microbes, specially engineered to produce specific compounds we regularly rely on petrochemicals for. But the challenge was the same as lab meats. How would they ever do this at scale for a reasonable price? Zymergen went public in April 2021. But just four months later, they announced that they would bring in zero dollars in product revenue for 2021 and 2022. CEO Josh Hoffman ended up leaving Zymergen in August of 2021. And by July of 2022, 94% of the company's stock value had vanished since going public. A former employee said that Josh Hoffman misled people with exaggerated financial figures and made overly optimistic projections about the company's capabilities. It's a bit ironic that what I've learned says to not be so naive to the power of storytelling and then goes on to tell us a story completely unrelated to cultured meat. Amazing. So this next part didn't make it to the actual video, but it is in the transcript for the video. It says, quote, speaking of contaminants, as revealed by their own data submitted to the FDA, a different company's lab-made chicken had five milligrams of lead per 100 grams, more than the safe daily limit for children, which is three micrograms. So the document itself that what I've learned 
Warren is referring to says that the levels of heavy metals are below any concentrations that would lead to safety concerns. In other words, it's safe. But of course, what I've learned left that out. What's also funny is that ground chicken samples were sent for analysis alongside the culture chicken and the ground chicken tested positive for salmonella. So we have another thing that what I've learned failed to mention. I wonder why. And it also seems like what I've learned doesn't know that this symbol means micro and not milli. And it also seems like what I've learned doesn't know how to spell milligram. I just want to share a quote from Einstein where he failed to predict a future technology's viability. He says, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. So if Einstein failed at predicting a future technology's viability, what hopes should we have in what I've learned successfully doing so? All right, guys. Well, that's the end of the video. We got a little over half of his video done. I'm not going to be covering the rest because it gets into a lot of investor mumbo jumbo and addressing it would involve just repeating what I've already said in this video. So thank you so much for watching. Again, if you support videos like this that are super in-depth and want to make them more, you know, likely and more possible and easier for me to dedicate time to commit to, please consider supporting on Patreon. It makes my job a lot easier. Share this around to people who are doubting cultured meat or who were convinced by what I've learned in this video. It's clear his video on lab-grown meat was just as, if not more misguided than his video on vegan diets not working. And lastly, if you don't know, I do have a book going over most, if not all, of the anti-vegan arguments you're going to hear online. If you want to get that as well, that'll be linked in the pinned comment. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Dude, fuck off. I don't want anything to do with you. Don't ever speak to me again. You're a fucking piece of shit. Even vegans don't get your weird stupid wannabe sense of irony here who's your audience nobody gets these dumb jokes dude 